Well, I'm here at the San Antonio Botanical Gardens. It's actually one of my favorite places to go. <laughs> so in the last section, we saw uh, you know, something that Russell is pushing, is that uh, all of our, uh, good, not all of our, but a good chunk of our knowledge, especially knowledge about uh, anything that dealing with the laws of nature, anything dealing with the physical sciences, anything we're dealing with what we expect to happen tomorrow or the next minute, relies upon the principle of induction. Now, the principle of induction cannot be proven using experience. So the question is whether anything can justify the principle of induction. Now, in this section, Russell notes that the, that the principle of induction is not alone. Right? Uh, he gives what he, you know, he gives in the, in the text something that we can maybe generically call the principle of inference. Right? Uh, whatever follows from a true statement must also be true. Whatever follows from a true statement must also be true. Here's something that's true. I am a human being. You know what follows from that? I am a mammal. Now, since it's true that I'm a human being, it's also true that I'm a mammal. So that's just a general principle of inference. But here's something that Russell notes. Like, look, the principle of deduction is not justified, or at least not by experience. If we're going to justify the principle of deduction using, exper uh, using experience, then we have to rely upon the principle of deduction. Well, the principle of deduction is not alone in this. Suppose I just gave a principle right there, principle for inference. Whatever follows from a true statement uh, is also true. Okay. Well, suppose I want to construct some kind of argument proving that principle of inference. What would it look like? Well, suppose you just list a thousand reasons, right? A thousand reasons for why the principle of inference is true. Unless you have some kind of statement that says, for all these reasons, for all these true reasons, the principle of inference follows, you cannot justify the principle of inference. But having that statement is an instance of the principle of inference. So the principle of inference itself must be, it cannot be uh, proven in that way, right? There is no proof for it. The principle of induction is in this is, is in this trap. So is the principle of inference. My question then is, well, how, how do we know these things? Do we know these things? How do we come about to have these kinds of universals, these general principles, as knowledge? Well, so, I mean, there's lots of issues here, all right? We kind of went through real fast why we can't prove these things. And, uh, you know, we can even, we still ask the question, well, okay, so you've given this reason why we can't prove, it by, prove any of this by experience. Well, let's suppose we can prove it by experience. What would be required to prove these things by experience? When we're dealing with something like the principle of induction, we would have to be familiar, directly acquainted, right, or, or at least you know, have some kind of acquaintance uh, with everything, right? If we're going to have the principle of induction and it's going to be justified by experiences, right? Uh, you know, talk about gravity, right? So, uh, or, or, yeah, or, or, sorry, yeah, talk about gravity. Each time I throw something in the air. So let's, here, here we go, here are my keys, right? So by experience, I know that those two times three times, I throw my keys in the air, they're going to come back down, right? So the principle of induction says that the past, oh, so the future will resemble the past, okay? Now, if I'm going to justify by experience the, this law of gravity, I have to experience every single time that gravity affects objects. And not just in the past, but in the future. And not just here, but everywhere. That is an incredibly large number of things to experience, which I can't do. And this is the failing of empiricism, you know, what Russell's talking about. is There is simply too much out there to justify by experience alone. You have to have general principles. Yeah, the principle of induction. We say, well, you know, my knowledge that this 
we'll come back down as nearing certainty. Never quite gets, gets there because I don't know what the future is and, and everything else. But it's nearing certainty, right? Well, the same thing is true for um, a lot of other kinds of truths that don't have to deal with experience or you deal with your know, objects necessarily. So you know, deal with mathematics, right? Here's a number, 5,268. Here's another number, 3,392. Okay? Now you multiply those two numbers together and you get another number. All right? Well, you know how to do this. You can sit down and do the calculations of this thing. Um, but the reason why you know how to do this is because of that principle of inference that I mentioned earlier. You understand what, it, what the two numbers mean, what a multiplication and equality mean, to get a further number. But you simply haven't experienced all calculations. That is literally infinite. There is an infinite number of calculations. All right? Even if you're just dealing with the number one and adding it to every other number, that's an infinite number of calculations. If you deal with the number two and adding it to every other number, that's an infinite number of calculations. It's huge. Right? So experience uh, can't get us this kind of knowledge. So if we have this knowledge at all, Russell says, we have this knowledge uh, a priori. And this is knowledge that is proven independent of experience. And this is knowledge that's proven independent of experience. This is where he compares empiricism to rationalism. Empiricists say all knowledge is known through experience. That means every last bit of your beliefs that are knowledge are also proven through experience. This is compared to the rationalists. The rationalists say some of your knowledge is not known through experience. And what they mean by this, and this is a subtle distinction that Russell is making here, is that some knowledge is not proven through experience. So this is kind of a distinction between how we know something, right? or whether we have knowledge through experience or have knowledge uh, independent of experience. Now what he means here, and Russell's very clear about this, he, he sides with the rationalists in the sense that some of our knowledge is proven a priori, meaning it's proven independent of experience. Now, you still have to learn about these things through experience. Most of you learn about these things through mathematics, right? through your math class or through school. You learn about 2 plus 2 equaling 4 in school. But learning about it is not the proof. Okay? Learning about it is not the proof. So uh, here's where Russell makes an interesting distinction with this knowledge uh, between the rationalists and the empiricists. He kind of sort of sides with the empiricists in saying that everything that we learn, we learn through experience. But he also sides with the rationalists in saying not everything that's justified or proven is proven through experience. So when we're talking about proof, Russell is a rationalist. When we're talking about acquiring knowledge, Russell is an empiricist. It's an interesting little uh, distinction how he's trying to uh, keep the best, best of both worlds there. Remember, remember this is what we said, we, we talked about this, that uh, you know, he says that all knowledge, right, all knowledge is based upon acquaintance. And acquaintance is this direct experience with these things. Okay. So that's how Russell falls between the rationalist and the empiricist. And what he says are things like, he says that, uh, not, that, that some of our knowledge is proven independent of experience. Okay, so Russell's written a big check. <laughs> there are these, uh, there, there are some a priori knowledge. It's proven independent of experience. We know about it. We learn about it through experience simply because we're experiential creatures. But the proof for them is not in the experience. The proof it lies elsewhere. So uh, maybe to get an idea of what he's talking about, let, let's look at some of the things that uh, that he thinks are a priori uh, truths. Right? So all logical truths. Right? All logical truths. 
uh, in the supplement that I've given you to read philosophy, all the truth relations. Okay. True makes true, false makes false, true makes false, false makes true, all those truth relations and how they result in the different truths of logic that we have, the different inference rules, that's all a priori knowledge. The laws of thought that he provides, okay? The law of identity, whatever is, is. Right? And that just means that whatever exists is identical to itself and, and not identical to anything else. So I am identical to me, that tree is identical to that tree, but we're not identical to each other. Um, the law of non-contradiction. Uh, what uh, there is nothing that both is and is not. Uh, there is nothing you know, that both is and is not. You're looking at me and I exist. Well, that means that it's false that I don't exist. <laughs> uh, you're looking at me and I am human. Well, then it's false that I am not a human. All right. That's all that the law of non-contradiction means. And the law of excluded middle is uh, whatever is either is or is not. Okay. So you. So when we're dealing with whatever, either it is or it is not, all right? So, you know, either I am human or I am not human. Uh, uh, it is false that I am not human, so I am human. Okay, so laws of thought. Um, a lot of people argue that you could take the laws of thought and derive all of the laws of logic. This is what Aristotle tried to do. Okay. So laws of logic, that's a priori. Mathematical truths, that's also a priori. Two plus two equals four. 4 plus 4 equals 8, 8 plus 8 equals 16, 16 plus 16 equals 32, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, the mathematical truths give us the entire system of uh, mathematics that we have today. Okay. Uh, the last one is rather interesting that Russell gives, and he talks about uh, truths of value. And this has to be a priori. What is actually value? Valuable. That's an interesting thing to say. I mean, it's interesting because he says virtues are empirical, but what's valuable is not. Now, virtues, I think what he means this is, you know, virtuous, what's virtuous is what helps us get what's valuable, right? And we can, we can observe this, right? We talk about health. Health is valuable, right? Uh, uh, the health, a healthy body is a valuable thing. Uh, but we can't just simply intuit what is healthy. We have to go out and observe behavior to find out what constitutes health. So, eating right and exercise. We've learned this through experience, okay? But health itself is not learned, you know, that, that health is valuable is not learned as a matter of experience. That's just, ner that's just known a priori. Now he gives, these are the examples of some of the a priori truths. Now he, he says something kind of interesting before he goes into these examples. He says the reason why these are a priori, the reason why these are known independent of experience is he uses this phrase, they are self-evident self-evident. Now, that's an interesting claim. They're self-evident. What does that mean? If I was feeling sufficiently poetic, I might make some kind of crack about philosopher coming out of the mists of obscurity to reveal the truth. I think we're all glad that I'm not feeling poetic. Okay. Self-evidence. Well, to understand self-evidence, let's contrast it with evidence. All right. One of the things that Russell says is that our you know, knowledge of what exists is not known a priori. If we have knowledge of what exists, we always have to have some evidence of it. So I have some knowledge, I have knowledge that at least one waterfall exists. All right. And what's my evidence? Well, I go out, you know, so I, I have this knowledge of what a waterfall is. So I go out and I look for it. Now look for this evidence. My evidence is I look for water falling from someplace. Right? That's kind of straightforward. Uh, I listen. I have, listen for a sound of waterfall. I uh, listen for a certain t uh, touch for a waterfall, right? All this is evidence. Now, how it impacts my senses and everything else, right? We deal with knowledge by acquaintance. Now, um, all this is evidence plus some knowledge of truths. You're going to say the principle of induction. That together gives me the knowledge that waterfall exists. So I look for evidence other than the, other than the claim 
that waterfall exists. So I have this claim, the waterfall exists, right? Or there is a waterfall. There's a waterfall, San Antonio Botanical Gardens. But I look for evidence other than the proposition that a waterfall exists. And that evidence is what I see by the senses. Okay. Now, a self-evident knowledge claim, right? Self-evidential knowledge, what Russell's getting at these opera truths, is the claim itself is its own knowledge. Okay? The claim itself is its own evidence. Well, so we got these mathematical truths. Let, you know, let's deal with let's deal with the principle of inference that we dealt with earlier. Whatever falls from a true statement must be true. Why is that self-evident? Well, suppose you were going to construct an argument for it. If you're going to construct an argument for the claim that whatever is self-evident, uh, sorry, whatever is true, whatever falls from a true statement is true. Suppose you construct an argument for that. You would have to use the principle. Well, suppose you were wanting to construct an argument to reject it. You would still have to use the principle, right? You know, if your conclusion to that argument is the principle of inference, whatever falls through true statement is true, is not true, then you would lose reason to accept the principle. Oh, excuse me, you mean you lose reason to reject the principle. So any way you try to either prove or disprove the principle, you have to use it. It has to be there. And this is kind of what Russell means when he says it's impossible to doubt. Impossible to doubt. Okay, that's great for the principle of inference. What about the principle of deduction? Well, it, it's kind of the same thing. If you're trying to doubt it, how would you go about doing that? Well, you wouldn't use experience to doubt it. Or, excuse me, if you... <laughs> let me back up. If you're going to be able to doubt something, you're going to have to use experience. You're going to have to use experience. But anytime you use experience to either prove or disprove something, you have to use the principle of deduction. Right? Because the principle of deduction uses experience. It draws inferences from experience. So that's going to be impossible to doubt. Mathematical truths. Is it possible to doubt that 2 plus 2 equals, uh, two, two, two plus two equals 4? Say I want to say, well, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Well, how do you do that? Do you know what 2 means? Yes, I do. Do you know what addition means? Yes, I do. Do you know what equals means? Yes, I do. Do you know what 4 means? Yes, I do. So how is it possible that 2 plus 2 equals 5? Using the meanings of those terms. Well, it doesn't work. So, a priori truths are going to be self-evident in the sense that the truth itself is its own evidence. And on top of that, that it's impossible to doubt. Impossible to doubt. Right. It's going to be impossible to doubt because anytime you try to construct an argument to doubt it, you have to use it. That's, you know, one of the reasons. Okay. So this gives us an interesting distinction between a priori truths and any other kind of truth. A priori is known independent of experience because anytime, any way you try to reject it doesn't work. Yeah, so for that reason, it's impossible to doubt. Well, this leads to some other consequences. All right, a priori truth, Russell says, a priori truth is always hypothetical. It's always in a, a situation where um, you know we're dealing with meaning, right, or concepts, but not particular things. So I can doubt the existence of waterfalls. I can doubt the existence of waterfalls. Um, if I've never experienced a waterfall, I could doubt its existence. Heck, even if I have exi you know, experienced, you know, phenomena that tell me there's a waterfall, I could be hallucinating. I could be dreaming. So we can we can go back to all that material from the earlier chapter. Okay? Now, so knowledge of existing things can be doubted. So that means that knowledge of existing things can't be a priori truths, because right? a priori truths can't be doubted. So a priori truths never give us knowledge of existing things. It's only when we take other knowledge by acquaintance, so said data, that we add that together with a priori knowledge, that then I get knowledge by description of waterfalls. Right? And badgers and honey and everything else. So that's an interesting difference then between a priori truths 
and knowledge of existing things. Knowledge of existing things is not a priori. This is the mistake that the rationalists made. They thought that they could discern the existence of, ex of things simply by meanings of terms. And for Russell, it says it doesn't work. Another interesting difference is that a priori knowledge only deals with deduction. Whereas induction is a different kind of inference, uh, does not deal with a priori knowledge. Now, Russell gives a distinction between deductive and inductive. Uh, and you should, you should look at that from the book. So we definitely have questions about what's deductive and inductive according to Russell. So for Russell, deductive knowledge deals with the general. That you, that you start with the general, right? You either deduce, uh, you start with the general and you infer what's general, or you start with general and you infer what's particular. Whereas induction is you start with particular and you infer the general. We'll talk about it in class. It's not exactly going to work, uh, we'll talk, but we'll talk about that in class. You should still know how Russell distinguishes between those two. Uh, so, our prior knowledge deals only with what's deductive. Every, all the other knowledge deals with, deals with what's inductive. So, Russell gives us uh, a distinction in knowledge, right? And this distinction is important. We have a priori knowledge, and that's knowledge proven, independent of experience. And we have ex uh, empirical knowledge. Right? Empirical knowledge relies either in whole or in part on experience. Now, even though Russell's given us this kind of preliminary uh, of, of uh, you know, the different, uh, 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 some kind of uh, a preliminary argument about uh, what, what justifies a priori knowledge, he's still going to ask the question, how is a priori knowledge possible? And he deals with that in the next section.